Yes, it tends to get worse than other. For those of you just entering the webinar, we are going to give people about 30 more seconds to join, um, and then we'll proceed with inter introductions. I know it's just kind of a lot for you, but this is just some more data yeah. for you. So you can right. kind of we, we might want to mute so we can get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Karen Diver. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, which is the virtual site of today's program. I have previously served as the chairwoman of my own tribe, the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and served in the Obama administration as the special assistant to the president for Native American affairs. On Friday, I joined the University of Minnesota as senior advisor to the president. A few announcements while we get started. On behalf of the Ash Center at Harvard, who is our host for today's program, um, we'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. This event is being recorded and the video will be made available publicly on the Ash Center YouTube channel and through the website of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. We welcome your questions today and we ask that you not use chat, please use the question and answer session so we don't miss any of your participation. I'd like to introduce our distinguished speakers today um, who will be joining us for this session on the American Recovery Act. We're honored to welcome Andrew Work, president of the Fort Belknap Indian community and a leader on the nationwide efforts to secure support for tribes efforts to deal with the COVID pandemic. Thank you for joining us, Mr. President. We also have Burton Warrington joining us from Wisconsin. Burton is a citizen of the Menominee Nation and previously served as a senior official in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the US Department of Interior. He's currently the president of the Indian Av Group. Our next two guests have been front and center in the national shape federal coronavirus relief funding for tribal nations. Jen Weddle is a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation and a co-chair of the American Indian Law Practice Group at the Greenberg Trying Law Firm. Del Lavador is a citizen of the Crow Nation, an attorney and former Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Finally, Joe Kalt is a professor emeritus at Harvard, um, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and for more than 30 years has co-directed the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. Joe, would you like to get us started? You and your colleagues at the Harvard Project have been researching and writing a lot about both the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. How do you see today's program helping Indian country as it faces the challenges that ARPA is creating? Thank you, Karen. Um, uh, this program that we're putting on today speaks to how important ARPA is, as well as the other federal funding. Uh, Indian country has a once in several generations opportunity before it to get the resources that have so long uh, been withheld uh, from the federal government, apply those resources to build and rebuild tribal nations. In that effort, in that effort, there's going to be responsibility on both sides. Obviously the federal government um, needs to run these programs that we'll talk about today uh, in a way that maximizes their contribution to tribal communities. At the same time, 
tribal governments uh, bear a tremendous responsibility because in many cases, the funding that's coming through now is many times greater than has ever been seen before uh, by, by tribes. And the challenges are great, strategic planning, picking projects, um, hiring consultants, contracting, planning, all of that is going to be a tremendous challenge. What we hope to do in these programs, and this will just be the first one, we'll be doing them every two weeks, is to try to provide some information uh, that'll be usable um, by tribal leaders as they go through their, their efforts uh, to maximize the contributions of the ARPA funding to their communities. And so we welcome you and we hope that uh, these programs turn out to be useful um, and, uh, and really allow the ARPA funding to be what it promises to be. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much, Joe. And that, that overview is perfect because tribal leaders get information from so many different sources, but at the end of the day, real decisions have to be made for their communities and they need to sort through it all. So these tools will be really helpful for them to make the most of um, ARPA. Burton, you have been um, picking up COVID relief funding. You've been picking it apart, um, trying to make it a little more sensical for tribes to be able to use, uh, use it. Um, now you're diving into ARPA. Um, can you give us an overview of the funding as you see it? Yeah, I'd be happy, happy to, Karen. And uh, I'm Bonomini on my uh, father's side, Prairie Band Potawatomi and Ho-Chunk on my mother's side, and actually uh, enrolled citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, but uh, born and raised in the nominee. Sorry about that. Uh, as, as Karen said, I've, I've, been, I've been following this quite quite a bit. Um, in what we're looking at trying to do is help to set the table, uh, help help to set the table for uh, what does this all mean. So, in doing that, we want to understand where we've been, uh, where we are today, and then where we might be going. So, I'm going to run through uh, <clears throat> just briefly the six. Um, major federal responses um, since March 6th of 2020. So um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there's been about roughly about $5.3 trillion in federal relief that's come down uh, since March 6th of last year. Um, as, as you'll see, the first response was on March 6th, about an $8 billion bill um, that was passed 12 days later. A second bill was passed about $192 billion. And then nine days after that um, is when the uh, big action in 2020 happened was the uh, CARES Act. So about a $2 trillion spending bill. And what was significant about the CARES Act is this is the first act where we've seen significant uh, federal dollars coming down to Indian country, uh, specifically in a term of uh, money that was set aside for Indian country, as well as money that Indian country was um, eligible for. <clears throat> so, uh, and I, I just wanted to clarify too, when I talk Indian country, um, I understand that has a lot of different definitions um, and it, it's meant to include uh, Alaska and Alaska native uh, communities as well. Um, <clears throat> April 24th, uh, we had the fourth bill, about a $483 billion bill. And then there, there was a lull um, through much of 2020, all the way until December 27th when the Consolidated Appropriations Act passed <clears throat> about $868 million of spending. But um, one of the most significant parts of that December 27th bill is that it extended the time uh, for tribes on when you had to use your coronavirus relief funding. And then fast forward into uh, March of, of this year, uh, ARPA passed. Uh, again, similar in size to CARES, about a $1.9 trillion bill. But what is really significant about ARPA is it um, had about $32.5 billion of direct set-aside money for Indian country. So um, <clears throat> similar in size to CARES Act, but about three times the money that was guaranteed to come uh, to tribal communities in, in Indian country. So <clears throat> um, what, one of the things that's helped me to understand uh, there's so much different bills coming, so much different funding streams that uh, one way that I've uh, made sense of it is understanding that there is specific set aside money coming down in one bucket. Um, it, it's on the left left hand side there. Uh, and when I say specific set asides, that money has to go to Indian country. So uh, roughly about 10 and a half billion, as I've said, and for those of you that are familiar with it, about 8 billion of that was coronavirus relief funding. And then off to the right hand side of the screen, 
um, there was a, a lot larger um, pot of money that Indian country was eligible for, but it wasn't exclusively for Indian country. So uh, that, that's really significant in trying to make sense of all of these different pots of money coming down in these different funding streams. Um, another thing I did want to note was uh, in that second bucket of money that is not exclusively for Indian country, um, it, it was a lot of different federal agencies that maybe tribes don't deal with all the time. So um, there was some additional complexities, but you see like the SBA, IRS, uh, Federal Reserve uh, System, Department of Commerce, um, you get down to some of the other ones like National Endowment for the Humanities and um, the Institute of Museum Library Services. So there was just a lot of different money in agencies that we don't traditionally uh, interact with. Um, when you jump over to ARPA, um, a, a similar setup, there's again, specific set-asides. Uh, in this instance, uh, a look, right around in the neighborhood of 32.5 billion. And what's significant about this is 20 billion of it is coming down through the uh, fiscal recovery fund, the FRF. And then there's about another 12 and a half billion uh, that will come to Indian country in one way, shape or form. And then uh, again, there's a second bucket of money in ARPA, which is money that tribes are eligible for, but again, it's not exclusively for Indian country. Um, <clears throat> it, it is wrapping up on setting the table. There's uh, several things that um, I think are important to be mindful of. Um, first is understanding this two bucket system. Um, how do you access money that's <clears throat> uh, coming out of bucket one, the money that is set aside for Indian country? Uh, where is it located? How do you access it? And uh, when do you have to uh, access it? <clears throat> um, and some of that money is being pushed down automatically through existing funding streams and some of it you have to apply for. Uh, when you get to the second bucket, that you have to be a lot more proactive going after that money. Uh, not too much of that money is just automatically getting pushed out. So uh, just uh, noticing a couple different um, nuances there. <clears throat> Uh, the third bullet point, uh, very important, is every federal dollar has strings attached to it. Uh, in this instance, permitted uses of those funding streams. Uh, so when you're trying to figure out what are the permitted uses, uh, statutes are, are uh, always the first thing to go to, federal regulations, uh, agency interpretations and guidance uh, help you understand uh, what are permitted uses of any specific funding stream. And then uh, the fourth bullet point that I think is uh, important to be mindful is the timeline on which each of these funding streams have to be spent. And uh, they vary quite a bit by specific funding stream, by statute that they were passed in out of these six bills. And then uh, lastly, just to wrap up, uh, what does this all mean is when tribes are looking at strategies and deciding uh, which funding streams to use, uh, when to use them and then how to maximize those resources, uh, even though we're talking about ARPA, some of the projects may be funded partially by ARPA, partially by one of the previous five bills, and uh, some of that can get quite complicated. So we're going to try to unpack a little bit of that and talk about some of the uh, kind of trending issues or things that we're seeing come up uh, over and over again. So I uh, appreciate the time, Karen, and uh, hope that helped to set the table a little bit. Thank you so much, Burton. It's very helpful. Tribes have had to deal with the pandemic. Um, they've had to deal with federal agencies, local agencies, funding deadlines that were shifting um, constantly that were constrained over their use, which wasn't necessarily what the communities needed. And now we have ARPA, um, which is what is being called um, by some on this um, panel, um, the Marshall Plan um, for Indian Country, the largest influx of cash um, and resources that we have seen um, ever into Indian country. And President Work, um, you are the boots on the ground, the front line, um, taking care of your community and having to navigate um, all of this. How is Fort Belknap prioritizing and planning and trying to be a good steward of this opportunity to make the most impact um, for your nation? Well, uh, good afternoon again. Well, obviously, uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, for you folks and um, the folks that are in the room here with me, Jennifer and Dell and the panelists and people on the call and everyone that's out there in Zoomland or in Indian country, uh, you're in my prayers. 
And it's been a rough year, the last year uh, for everyone. And, you know, things have changed forever with COVID, with this pandemic, our future. And we've pushed, uh, it's kind of been a double-edged sword at times because we've pushed into a, we've been pushed further into a virtual world, right? Uh, like we are right now. Uh, but, all, you know, the fact of being able to access and use technology has been helpful even to provide resources. Uh, but you know, our priority obviously is first and foremost to our, our tribal members here that we serve as a tribal government, uh, myself and our tribal council and our programs. And it's been, like I said, a real rough year the last year. Uh, we've lost uh, some folks due to COVID. We've had some folks do uh, that uh, have been sick and we've just tried to do the best that we can with the existing resources that we have and the resources the additional resources that we've received from Congress and the administration, you know, some way, in some ways for us, uh, it, we're fortunate that we're so rural up here where we're at in Montana. Uh, but in some ways we're not, because as you know, a lot of the challenges that we have providing access to healthcare or access to resources for our tribal members, especially being so rural, um, has been a problem uh, for us even before COVID. So, you know, obviously what we did, you know, when, when COVID hit, uh, I think just like everyone else, I mean, and like you mentioned, it shifted day by day. You know, we had to make decisions right away, like you say, uh, you know, boots on the ground here. And, you know, our council has been very diligent. I will say that. And with our DS, uh, very diligent, uh, our staff and our community, uh, for being diligent and looking out for one another uh, to keep one another safe out here. You know, like I said, we've we've lost uh, some loved ones. We peaked last October with our COVID cases. But at times, uh, and even when it started, we didn't hardly have any COVID cases here at all. And you know, I really want to thank our community, and like I mentioned, our council and our staff for that, for, you know, and a lot of prayer here. Um, but, you know, we did have uh, some outbreaks here, like I said, lost loved ones, and try to do the best we can to get that under control, uh, not only with uh, our own DES or our tribal health department and services we provide, but partnering with IHS here, too. Uh, you know, fortunately for us here in Fort Belknap, we have a lot of nurses, which is very helpful uh, with other staff. I, I wanted to mention our nurses, but with other staff to be able to resp respond and be proactive. Uh, you know, along the way, we did a, a uh, pilot project with CDC for testing, which was very helpful out here. Uh, we were one of the first service units to receive in our area to receive uh, vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine. And, you know, just like everywhere else, uh, you know, Moderna came and uh, we were able to vaccinate uh, younger people now, you know, 16 to 18 and now 12 to 15 that we're rolling out. And we've had a good response to that. You know, we had, like I said, the, the pilot project, we've had drive-through testing. We've done a lot of education and community outreach to try to encourage people to uh, to get vaccinated and follow the council's restrictions that we have uh, in place here to keep everyone safe. And, you know, like you see around the rest of the country and even kind of like right now, there's a breaking point, you know, with uh, people making a choice whether to get vaccinated or not. And, you know, we could continue to try to do education on that. Um, it's a balance, right, with trying to get people to get vaccinated and to lift restrictions as we come out of COVID, you know, and try to get back to some type of normalcy. You know, the council has approved, our council has approved a, you know, earlier in the year, a phased plan uh, for reopening for throughout the year. Uh, we're currently in our phase one where we're lifting some restrictions. You know, we've partnered as much as possible with our local school districts. Uh, trying to allow people to um, do more things as a community. 
And we're getting ready to go into our phase two uh, to lift more restrictions in, in uh, the first part of June. But like I said, you know, we're, we're really at a breaking point where we've, we've, uh, we've got enough vaccinations for everyone. We wanna continue to encourage people to get vaccinated. It's still their choice. And we've even offered that to our neighbors, especially like non-beneficiaries here through our local service unit to help with schools. Uh, you know, COVID has, doesn't have any boundaries, right? Doesn't discriminate. And so we want to uh, help our neighbors and, uh, you know, that's been good. You know, that's what's important about this, uh, you know, the, our prayer and the creator wants us to be good to one another and look out for one another, uh, regardless of your race or who you are. Uh, so that's been our council's focus here in Port Belknap. Um, and like I said, we've been very fortunate. Uh, you know, and as far as planning goes, uh, you know, we've been able to take advantage of the resources that have been provided by Congress and the administration, like Burton mentioned. And we've also had some challenges with that and learned uh, from it. Uh, you know, and I'm really glad that uh, the deadline uh, for the end of last year uh, was removed, that put so much pressure on us here in Fort Belknap and other tribes uh, to make rash decisions. You know, we were trying to make the best decisions as quickly as possible to respond to the pandemic and help people and streamline services to get out to, to help folks here. But uh, that put a lot of pressure on. I'm glad that's been removed. Uh, like I said, we've, especially like the CARES Act, we've learned uh, with some of the challenges that we've had with it. Uh, even if it's uh, being done quickly, planning, you know, making sure we have good planning and good capacity. Uh, and like I said, learning from the CARES Act with the decisions that uh, we make uh, as quickly as possible to get resources to people. Uh, you know, and it's, it's true, you know, it's COVID, uh, you know, and the funds that we're receiving you know, has been better for us economically and is going to be with ARPA, um, with our, our history here. And, you know, as you know, I mean, tribes are always, right, they're always lobbying and they're always trying to um, get a fair shake from the United States on uh, what is due to us or what is owed uh, based on our agreement, right? Uh, since the inception of this country and uh, Indian people were placed on reservations, but, you know, we're looking forward to, to ARPA now. Like I said, we had those challenges and we're doing a lot of, a lot of planning. We're actually, we're planning today, doing some strategic planning and we've had prior strategic plans, whether that's here with our own council or our programs or our entities that are, are within the reservation, but we really want to look, uh, to the future beyond our lifetime, you know, and we're having some good conversations about capital investments and infrastructure here. And, and I think as most folks know, right, there's been a lot of consultation over the last year, uh, you know, a lot of it due to COVID. And now uh, with the president, uh, you know, I got to mention that executive order 13175. I've always been a big fan of it. And I'm really glad that the president reaffirmed that on January 26th. And so that's added another layer of consultation for tribes, but it's been good. It's been good because uh, it's a good order and it's important based on our agreement uh, that we have with the United States and being treated fairly like states and, and territories. and. We have submitted a lot of comments based on the consultation we have almost on a daily basis in accordance with the president's memo. And it has to be meaningful. It really does. Uh, and it has to be meaningful with ARPA, uh, with the intent that Congress had and negotiating rules uh, to come up with a good plan. You know, I'm waiting to see myself, unless I've missed it, uh, some of these plans that are supposed to be, I think, coming back to tribes before. Um, they're finalized and submitted over at OMB. Uh, so it is meaningful, but the, the reason I'm mentioning that is because with ARPA, with the reading that I've done, 
uh, in the prior presentation, uh, you're seeing guidance that comes out, right? Obviously, it's still restricted money, and it all um, revolves around responding to the pandemic, even for us here as a government for services that we provide. But I really want to stress the fact that it's important that we stay focused and be mindful of Congress's intent. I really appreciate that I think um, tribes um, had a voice being unified. We're all unique, right? And we all manage our own, own affairs, but I really did see a lot of tribes throughout the country come together and be unified in our COVID response. And that's, that's great. That's what we do great as tribes because it's so personal and you're here, um, you know, you, you work with your relatives, your friends, you meet with them, you see them on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're in or out of work. I mean, tribal government is very personal and that's important to remember. And so that, that's what I mean when I talk about tribes coming together also and being unified. So, um, I think Congress listened for sure to tribes, even the difference between the CARES Act and ARPA with their intent. It's important to give tribes broad discretion. And like I said, give them the same um, leeway, I guess, you know, or respect tribal sovereignty and tribes authority like states and territories to make um, the best decisions that they can and that they're able to do. Getting to my point is with ARPA, stick to the act, you know, and as these rules come out and even agencies have interpretations of the act, make sure that uh, you're interpreting the, the act correctly with the guidance or the rules that you put out and don't get away from Congress's intent. Um, and I, I heard that from members of Congress, you know, that give tribes, you know, the respect that they deserve and, you know, respect their, their authority to make our own decisions. Uh, so I, I just wanted to mention that on today's call that that's a very important to be mindful of when you talk about any loss of revenue or ne any negative economic impacts, it was in in intended to be broad. So tribes can make the best decision making um, like they do. So, but again, you know, like I said, we're, we're planning. Uh, it's a lot of responsibility with ARPA, but we definitely are looking generations down the road to provide better infrastructure here uh, and capital investments, you know, to provide good futures for our, our tribal members because, you know, the pandemic has changed our lives uh, forever. But I'll just keep you folks in my prayers and it's a good discussion. I just appreciate the time today and I, I thank you and I'll keep praying for everyone else as we come out of COVID uh, throughout the country. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for your thoughtful answer and for really differentiating some of the on the ground decision making between immediately responding um, with immediate needs under CARES Act and now the balance that needs to be there under ARPA, um, where it's remediation from COVID, but it's also those generational impacts and requires thoughtfulness. Um, to that end, Jen, we're, you know, these funding streams are complicated um, with decision making that does require some upfront work to make the most of it. Um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of a softball question because one of the things we're hearing immediately from tribal leaders is they're challenged because their community members may be thinking of ARPA in the same way as CARES Act. And that was driven by immediate need crisis mode, people needed to keep their lights on, et cetera. And so their citizens may be looking at this ARPA money in much the same vein, but it's not really intended for that. Can you use, can tribes use ARPA money for per cap, for per capita payments? So the guidance thus far is silent. The statute is silent on that. It's neutral. It doesn't uh, prohibited, it doesn't permit it. Uh, the guidance does refer to, I think, good common sense and proportionality uh, to make findings that additional direct relief to tribal members uh, is necessary. Uh, so not a one size fits all solution. 
uh, and also requires some finding and record keeping that uh, the any any previous tribal stimulus or per capita payments, any previous relief payments, any um, federal stimulus dollars are insufficient to meet the needs of those members. Maybe they're enduring something, um, co some continuing impact uh, or inability to go back to work because they had COVID or any number of things. So I, I think as President Work was referencing, there's flexibility, um, but there's also the burden to make sure that any expenditures like that are justified. Uh, and I think what we've seen both uh, from members of Congress, who I think will, will be with us in future sessions, uh, uh, that we've seen in the legislative history of ARPA and that we're certainly seeing from our friends from the Department of Treasury is a strong desire to put these monies to their highest and best use in Indian country. Um, this really is a historic level of resources and um, query what the, what the best investment is for all of our unborn grandchildren. Um, what, how will this money benefit them? This money really belongs to those forthcoming generations. And that's gonna be in long-term investments in Indian country that we also ensure are sustainable for those generations and not in short-term emergency relief. Cause I think we're, we're turning out of the emergency and now going toward Indian countries long-term resilience. That's a great point. And one of the things that has consistently been brought up um, is infrastructure, infrastructure, um, you know, and you think of that really quite traditionally, you know, you think of it as roads, sewer, water, and certainly Indian country needs those things. Broadband, um, we've all learned the need to be connected um, while we were isolating to do telehealth and to do education and to continue our work. Um, for either Jen or Dell, um, are there uses that would be considered infrastructure beyond those ones that most easily come to mind? Well, I guess uh, besides the ones that you mentioned, Karen, uh, and by the way, thank you and appreciate President Work's words and, and praying for everybody as they're trying to recover from the pandemic. Um, you know, I think because there has been a change in administration, we've seen a change in interpretation of the federal statute that's right now being delivering the resources. Under CARES, it wasn't intended for permanent infrastructure. It was all, as you mentioned, emergency situation, response, give people the resources they need and equipment, testing, et cetera. Um, and you see a transition to the um, ARPA and ARPA looks, because it has a five and a half year window for the funds to be spent, you can look for long-term. You don't have to just have a six month or a one year fix. It can, you can look at one, three, five, five and a half year plans and to utilize um, the funds for a variety of things. And I see on the slide that you have up, um, which is you know similar to what Treasury has done in their consultation is um, you do have the, classic investment of infrastructure that you mentioned, this premium pay for essential workers, there's categories of them, uh, your teachers, first responders, those in public health. Um, you also see uh, the reference that President Work had to negative economic impacts, which I view as happening to people. You see a human resource piece to this as opposed to traditional infrastructure. And I think what's really unique too is that there's a real emphasis and focus on public health and behavioral health in particular, because I think um, what's interesting that maybe um, is even more unique to Indian country is the intergenerational trauma that occurred from colonialism and the lack of investment and underinvestment, not only in the infrastructure, but in the human beings that we represent and who we are in these communities. And for the first time, we're seeing this large influx of dollars that says public health is a priority. And you don't see that very often. What you see are the, the fixes at the local IHS or the area office. And here they're saying, you no, know, public health is broadly defined and includes mental and substance abuse and other disorders. And I think by giving the resources to those professionals that can provide those, 
we can help remedy some of the intergenerational trauma and the pandemic response to trauma and help lead them to healthy whole lives in Indian country and not have limited uh, lives based on what already happened to them and having the pandemic add to that. So to me, that is a much broader perspective and I'm very grateful and thankful for ARPA in looking at that in a much larger context. Can I make a, ask for a point of clarification, um, Del? Um, we know the trouble that tribes had spending CARES Act money and you referenced the timeline um, for ARPA. Um, so it's one thing to spend it and it's another thing to encumber it, perhaps have the money under contract um, so that it's obligated. Um, could you just provide a little bit more clarity on that if we know it? Yeah, uh, ARPA, uh, the statute actually says March 3rd, 2021 is when the expenses start that are covered and eligible for, for being covered um, under ARPA. And then there's actually a middle, um, middle timeline, which is December 31st, 2024, as people may see on the screen. And that is when it needs to be obligated. So in that situation, you have contracts, uh, grants, agreements, um, MOAs, whatever um, instrument there is that commits those funds, obligates them, and then you have another two years to actually spend them. And I think that, has, that will do a great service for looking towards uh, larger long-term projects. And as tribal leaders are looking at the intergenerational impact of what these funds may provide going forward. Thank you for that, Del. And Jen, you actually referenced um, requirements around record keeping um, and justification for use of ARPA funds. Um, once again, CARES Act was, you know, people were trying to be compliant. Um, the rules seemed like they were a moving target. In some days they did the best they could. The timelines for ARPA actually allow for much more rigorous oversight. Um, so can you, and there was an actual question in the question and answers about that of getting pushback from auditors and how to figure out where to find the guidance on allowable uses um, and the record keeping and things like that. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share on that? Sure, and I'm um, purposely distant from the chat because it's always dangerous to sit with the president of your tribal client while your law school girlfriends are posting things in the chat. So um, th thank you for reading those. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, record keeping, I think it's, it's really about uh, being contemplative, uh, being serious good stewards of the money. Uh, the current guidance is that any expenditure over $50,000 uh, is, is likely to be fly uh, by Treasury. And as much as these are, you know, this represents a historic investment in Indian country, um, it's also a historic amount of money uh, for the Department of the Treasury to, to oversee compliance with. Uh, so I think everything is going to become much more important. The accounting, making sure your accounting team is covered with adequate insurance, legal opinions uh, around uh, uses of the money, uh, trying to make sure that uh, you make really good solid findings about your uses of the money, um, how, they are, how those uses are pandemic responsive, um, really taking all the care you can to make sure that your expenditures are really uh, bulletproof on the back end. Del, do you wanna add to that? I would just add on the on the slide, you'll see that they largely go by quarterly project and expenditure reports, and that those will be kind of regular reporting that will go back to Treasury to to monitor the um, more than fifty thousand dollar expenditures, and that those will be routine quarterly and annual reports that'll track all of the dollars and be sent into Treasury. So one thing, practical thing tribal leaders might want to do is create segregated accounts, bank accounts by project, so that every dollar that's going to a particular effort with ARPA funds is easily segregated and trackable uh, so that these large volumes of dollars become easier to manage when they're broken out and segregated in that way. 
And Burton wanted me to mention um, that this is the direct funding for tribes out of ARPA. Um, so these timelines and requirements are tied to that. If you are um, going for eligible funding from other sources within the government, they're gonna have different rules, regulations, accountability measures and timelines. So please double check the source of your funds. Um, I hope I got that right for you, Burton. Thank you for trusting me with it. Um, Dell, are state recognized tribes going to be eligible for any of the direct funding? Well, I think that since this is a federal law with, with federal regulations and federal guidance, it's targeted towards federally recognized tribes under the Recognized Tribes List Act. And I think that state recognized tribes could utilize and access state uh, FRF funds because there are a number of states that are getting very large amounts of dollars and they could certainly apply or be eligible under state law. And referencing coordination with state partners is I think a really important point as well. Uh, wanna give huge kudos to the state of Montana and Governor Greg Gianforte and his team here who have plans in place to really engage uh, and share Montana's FRF monies with tribes and invest in infrastructure here that benefits all the citizens of Montana. And I think we'll, we'll emerge as a national leader uh, in, in how states and tribes can work together to maximize this money. Uh, and that's really a point that pervades, I think all of our uh, advice to, to tribes today to reach out and coordinate with your state partners, with your county partners, with your local government partners. Uh, and there may be a lot that you can do together to reduce costs and like I say, maximize the use of the dollars. Would that advice also apply to native led nonprofits um, that serve our citizens, either mostly off reservation, occasionally on reservation, would they follow those same streams of funding um, consistent with the state recognized tribe? Do we know that? So I, I would say, um, yes, many of those nonprofit entities may be eligible uh, for allocations, either from a, a state or tribal or local government. Okay. Uh, and it would just require the same level of findings that that was pandemic responsive and appropriate under the guidance. Okay, thank you for that. That was a question that came up um, in our question and answer. Um, Another challenge that tribes are facing immediately is um, managing a large influx of cash um, and funding um, that Treasury has already started to send out. Um, do we know or is there any best practices we can share um, regarding what tribes can do to manage their ARPA monies until they're ready to spend them? Um, Joe, can you help us out with Yeah, I, I think it's important. Um, tribes are getting funds already from the Treasury Department, and uh, they're not hopefully not being spent already in the sense that there is planning that needs to be done, priori priorities that need to be set. Um, and it's important, I think, uh, when these large amounts of monies come to a tribe to recognize a couple of things. One, the tribes have the opportunity to realize interest and in other earnings off of their funds. Um, if you put your funds in a simple savings account at the local bank or a checking account or something, you're not basically going to get any money off it. But uh, working with uh, qualified investment managers, um, and there are numbers of them out there, including many now uh, native-owned investment management firms, um, you have the opportunity to basically make interest on that money until you, until you spend it. And that's important. Um, you know, if you got in $100 million and you could earn 10% interest, that's $10 million you would be leaving on the table if you just put the money in the local bank or put it in a checking account. And so wise management means investing, I think, uh, these funds. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to do. You have ready access to them with good managers. Um, the other thing about those, those, that possibility and that opportunity to earn, earn some interest and income off of these funds is that, and, and Jen or Dell, correct me, you're the, you're the lawyers, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that interest income, if you got $100 million or $10 million in from uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury and you put it in investments, uh, 
waiting to be spent, but earning income for you while they were not being spent, that income off of your investments um, is uh, not subject to the same restrictions and requirements as to where you spend it and how you spend it. So for example, while there are deadlines, uh, Dell, what did you say? The uh, 2026 is the deadline for finally spending all the money. Is that right? Yeah, December 31st, 2026. 2026. But we all know that uh, there's a huge pro challenge and problem associated with infrastructure project projects, for example, where um, they have long-term maintenance and repair requirements that are going to go long, be long beyond 2026. And one of the things you can do with your interest income off of your, your funds, for example, is set up permanent maintenance accounts so that you always have the ability to go repair that new water and sewer system and go maintain that new broadband system uh, so that these projects don't turn into uh, sort of white elephants that sit out there and, and after a while don't work anymore because there wasn't enough money to keep them in, the, in repair. So the, the key piece of advice, I think, is that it's important for tribes to use smart financial management and be able to earn income off of their ARPA funds while they're waiting to spend those ARPA funds. Uh, there's a potential opportunity there that the tribes should not leave on the table. So I, I would add there, Joe, that um, the, all of this is sort of some very preliminary analysis and nothing that we're uh, providing today is legal advice to anyone. Uh, so I think that's an important disclaimer. Uh, and you know, the, these are our understandings on you know the, the guidance uh, that was updated yesterday and the FAQs and wading through a lot of this. I think specific questions about uh, what's allowable and what's not are things that um, collectively we intend to keep posting to the Harvard Project website to address in more detail in future sessions. And I think ideally to come up with kind of yes, no, maybe lists uh, for, for questions on can you do this with the money? Can you do that with the money? Again, things that are suggestions and that each tribe should review with their own legal counsel and staff team to make sure um, that everybody's coloring within the, the legal lines at all times. Yeah, I would, I would echo that about um, making sure you talk to your own legal counsel, your own accountant, uh, finance officer. Uh, I would also add that on the Treasury's website, that's probably going to be linked off of uh, the website here, there's actually a technical Treasury email for specific questions and they have personnel who will respond to those. And if there are enough of them, I think they, they get placed in the frequently asked questions. And so they'll post them in there and they'll periodically update those just like they did under the CARES Act. And so um, look to that piece of information if somebody has a real specific technical question that they want an answer to. Um, the other thing along these lines, uh, Karen, managing dollars is uh, tribes should be looking at what insti institutions are they holding these very voluminous amounts of monies at? Um, you know, are they FDIC insured? Um, do they need additional financial insurance products to make sure their money is safe and protected? Um, those are kind of immediate near-term questions that every tribe should be asking themselves. And to reiterate... I'm sorry, Joe, please go ahead. Just, just one more point. Um, the guidance isn't out yet on, on some of these questions. Um, but this is an area, as President Work said, where um, uh, recognition of sovereignty uh, should entail uh, discretion for tribes in these areas. And as the consultation process continues, uh, hopefully tribes will be pushing for discretion in, hand, in, how, they handle, in how they handle their funds. Um, but as, as Dell says, you know, no legal advice here. You, you have to consult the attorneys, but certainly this opportunity sits out there um, and it's appropriate that the Treasury Department provide that flexibility. And I'm gonna just chime in, kind of putting my former tribal leader hat on. Um, you need to advocate for yourself and what your nation needs. And as Dell said, they keep track of the commentary and there is a technical assistance page. Um, 
you need to protect the funds. You also need to look long term. You know, we were talking about, you know, earning interest income. Even if you buy bonds, something safe and not market risky, you're going to earn some modest rate um, of return that maybe you can hang on to to have something to fix the new things you're building um, or, or the new roads you're putting in, et cetera. Um, that's a type of stability that a lot of tribes haven't had. So if that's something that is desirable to you, push treasury, um, you know, and ask for that guidance. And, and as President Work said, you know, what did Congress intend? They intended this to make generational change. And if that gives you um, some sense of comfort and control over the future and being able to maintain it, then that's what you advocate for, okay? Um, Technical assistance, though, I mean, this is a hot topic that's coming up um, at this point of time with them funds hitting the door and everybody going, ah, um, can you fund technical assistance with the money? Can you take a chunk of it and say, we need to breathe, we need some advice, we need some strategic planning, we need to do some engineering studies, um, allowable use for tribes to just say, hey, we need a minute here to be smart, to be thoughtful, to be strategic. Can we get some help with that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think um, tribes are hoping to see a lot more of that coming from Treasury directly. Uh, but, but in fairness to Treasury, they have not only tribes asking those questions, but you know, more than a thousand governments, including state governments, as well as all the localities that are direct FRF recipients. And I think they'll again, this will be an area where there's opportunity for a lot of synergies with state and local partners. Um, can, can you pool resources and get some regional reports that you need? Um, and, and yes, uh, these contract support costs, the, um, the, the data that you need to be able to use these monies smartly, again, I think will all be justifiable, uh, but you really have to make sure that you have the record keeping to match up to what these expenditures actually related to. Um, one of the questions that came up um, from the audience so, um, so far is, you know, they're still not whole, um, even after CARES Act funding from lost revenues. Um, a lot of them dipped into um, reserves to keep basic operations going. Um, is an allowable use of the direct funding of ARPA um, kind of bringing them up to speed and helping them be whole so that they can be at full strength governmentally and um, otherwise in order to move forward? My answer to that would be not quite. Uh, you can't, for example, replenish a rainy day fund or a reserve. You can uh, replenish, for example, an unemployment pool. Uh, you can do some of those very specific things. And I think that's an area where tribal governments will again have to work very closely with treasury uh, to put forward what their specific circumstances are and what they're trying to do. Um, we've heard on some of the preliminary treasury consultations with tribal leaders uh, that that area, the lost revenue uh, bucket in ARPA is intended to be broad and flexible, uh, but how broad and how flexible remains to be seen. Yeah, I would say definitely have their, each, each tribe, if they can, have their own team look very closely at the interim final rule, which treasury has provided and look at the charts that are provided in there for lost revenue. And there's actually a, a methodology for calculating lost revenue since the act and also projecting your lost revenue over the next several years while the ARPA funds are eligible for use. So I would say look closely at that. And then if there's still any gray areas to, to seek um, some advice. Thank you for that. And for people who are on the webinar today, we will provide the link on the website um, afterwards for your ease of use. So you can go in and comment early and often and tell them what it is that your tribe and your communities need um, and to advocate for that sovereignty, um, that self-determination and that flexibility. Um, I would actually like to just take a minute here and to thank all of you for your time, your thoughtfulness, um, 
your expertise, um, your public service, um, as tribes try to figure out how they move past that next step. They, you know, the president, President Work said it, you know, we were trying to keep our people alive, right? Um, and, and still maintain basic government services, take care of our elders, take care of our children, provide education and all of those. Um, and now we're finally breathing that sigh and have this incredible opportunity at the same time. Um, so no rest for the weary, right? Um, and, and wanting to be smart about it. So thank you all for that. And I, and I hope this is useful and we'll continue to post links on the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development's website um, for additional ARPA resources, um, whether it's the direct funding or the funding that you can apply for. Um, we are going to have these sessions on different topics every two weeks. Um, as, as we said earlier, decisions are being made regularly, opportunities for advocacy in Indian country are there. Um, in two more weeks, we will present a program on best practices when it comes to strategic planning and priority setting. Once again, getting to that, this is a generational chance, how do we use it smartly? Um, we hope that you'll join us in two weeks. We're going to, oh, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. In two weeks, we're focusing on um, where is the rest of the money? We said that there is um, eligible money that tribes have to apply for. It is billions of dollars. Indian country needs to be ready. They need to know where to go. We're going to talk about that one in two weeks. Then following that, we'll be talking about strategic planning, best practices, um, what are tribes doing to really um, be smart about this historic opportunity. Um, once again, you'll find more information, a recording of today's program, any useful follow-up materials that we get our hands on as they become available at this website. And we thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, you have our best wishes and prayers for each of your communities. Please join us in two weeks and visit the Harvard Project's website. Thank you so much for joining us.